the last piece that clicked was, uh, okay, there's something big here. I love this industry. There's an ability to really make a difference for small businesses. And then it was like, you know what? This needs to be you doing it. It can't be somebody else executing on your vision. You need to do it. Hey, Alif Sheets, thank you for joining me all the way from California. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Michael. Of course. I'm, I'm both jealous and not jealous of you. I can't wait to come back and, 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 and live in Silicon Valley. It's such a, it's such a wonderful place. But, I, you know, it's, it's an interesting time where we are now. So I'll, I'll hopefully we'll get to meet in person in a few months. But for now, I'll get to hear all about your journey all the way from, uh, from Israel and Chicago Booth to Greylock, uh, McKinsey, and now Blue Vine. Uh, so, Eyal, First, walk me back all the way to your pizza delivery days. What, what is that all about? <laughs> um, I think, uh, well, I started my, my first job was delivering pizzas, okay? And I think this is uh, highlighting the fact that, um, um, you know, I didn't start my career in tech. And, and even, even furthermore, um, you know, kind of a funny or an anecdote here, I, I did not own a computer before I was around 22. Really? Um, so, yes, I I was a carefree teenager, surfed, uh, didn't really care about technology. Um, in the military, I served in infantry. I, I, I did not go to 82100 or 81100. Um, I, I basically um, decided to go and, and pursue a technology career back in, um, it was 2000 when I um, started my degree in electrical engineering. And um, it was due to a choice that I really didn't know what I wanted to do in life at the time. And high tech seemed like a good opportunity. You know, tech was booming in the year 2000. Um, didn't have a lot of sense of what that means, but you know what? You know, people are making good money in technology. Why don't I go into high tech? And the pizza delivery story connects to that, uh, I think a little bit even comically. I used to deliver pizzas. Um, I lived in Ramat Aviv at the time and I, I delivered pizzas um, in a, in a pizzeria in Almaty Gimel, and I used to deliver a lot to the technology, like the tech companies in, in Atidim and other places. And I asked them, like, "What are you guys doing?" And they were like, "Well, we're engineers." Um, <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, I need to go and do this job. This is a good job, you know, getting the pizza delivered to you yes. versus delivering." So um, that was the start of my. You know, my, my pizza delivery days kind of like rounded me into tech. I love that. What was it, Pizza Fino, by any chance? It was pizza fino. It is my all-time favorite pizza. I'm from Ramat Aviv as well, and I used to eat there almost on a daily basis. So, yeah. so we we already have a huge thing coming, in, and I'm hugely appreciative, even more than what you do at Blue Vine. I think what you did with Pizza Fino uh, tops that <laughs> much more. Uh, so, so thank you for that. But, but yeah, actually, your your entrepreneurial experience goes beyond just the just the pizzas and and what you and then your understanding to transition to a different industry. You, your family, you you say you're a third generation entrepreneur, right? So talk to me a little bit about, about that and, and how that runs in the family. Um, it's an interesting uh, story here. And, I, and I, I don't know if it runs in the family. And, and, and I'll explain further on that. Uh, my dad uh, was a small business owner. He had a physical therapy clinic in the Upper East Side of New York for, for 30 years. Um, his dad owned a um, kind of a lighting, electricity lighting store in, in Dizengo for 40 years. And so both of them were small business owners. And you know, the reason why small business owners start their business is many of them don't want a boss right. and they want to be able to run, you know, their own kind of thing and do their own, uh, you know, run their own show. And so I, I view small business owners as entrepreneurs by their own right. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they start their company their, or their business or their, you know, whatever. Um, and they share many of the same things that we do in, in startup land. When we start a company, there's many of the same pain points. You need to figure out your business plan. You're hiring, how to generate revenue. Of course, it's it's a different outcome. They're not looking to build you know, billion dollar companies, but there's a lot of the same stuff, especially when they start out. Right. Um, you know, in terms of running in the family, I don't know if it runs in the family. I, I didn't know that I wanted to be an entrepreneur up until I started Bluevine. If you look at my career, you know, it, it 
it's pretty it's a pretty safe journey. Uh, I kind of stuck to larger companies, pretty strong brand names. I didn't really take any risk before I started Bluevine. There are some people that you know they graduate from from college and they know that their destiny is to start a company. You didn't have they that. Know that they want to be an entrepreneur. I did not have that. Interesting. I was I I very much followed a safe path, and the reason I started Bluevine was less so about the personal um, you know interest or the draw to actually become a founder, but rather the opportunity and the calling. You know I. You know, even further adding to that, in the beginning, the mindset working in venture capital and seeing the opportunity to start Bluevine, I was like, why don't we find a CEO to do this? Well, why don't we find somebody else to do right. this? Right. I wasn't even thinking that this would be me, but I got so consumed with the idea and the opportunity that at some point, you know, this is mine. I need to really go do this. So walk me through that thinking process because you're a principal at, at Greylock, one of the best investment groups in the world, uh, based in, in you are in the in the cohort based in Israel. You're thinking about yep. this industry. You're thinking about small business owners. Obviously, this has a connection to you coming from a family of small business owners, and you're understanding that there's a gap in the market, an opportunity yep. that at the end you decide to go and fulfill it yourself with Bluevine. What are those weeks, days, months like? What does that process look like for a safe journeyed, you know, technology <laughs> guy and, and, and somebody who's working in tech, working in a fantastic brand name, McKinsey Greylock, and you're saying, you know what, I'm ready to go start my own journey. What is that thinking yep. process like for you? It was an evolution. Uh, so first, when you, when you work in venture, you get exposed to entrepreneurship in general. You work with a lot of founders, you assess investments, and um, you know entrepreneurship is, is somewhat infectious. You know, you see the excitement of, of people starting something from nothing. Um, you kind of follow their journey from the outside in, and um, you know there's a lot of excitement that rubs off. Mm -hmm. So first, you know, being in venture did move me closer in that direction. The story of Blue Line in the beginning was was more of an analytical exercise. I had an opportunity to look and, and see a lot of companies in the fintech space uh, through um, you know Greylock uh, Israel, and um, there were heavy investors in fintech at the time. And I realized that there's an opportunity, there's a white space, um, specifically at the time where we we restarted the company in factoring. And I was a big fan of what was happening in online financing, and I realized there were uh, still areas of opportunities. And so when I when I learned about factoring at the time, um, it clicked that there is an ability to take a page from what was being done in other in other sort of um, products and apply it here. And the market size is, is quite large. And and so that from an analytica from the outside in, it really connected. And then there was a personal passion always to um, um, evaluate and see opportunities within small businesses. And this does relate to my personal background. I did grow up around my father's business. I heard about him talking about growing up about with his father's business, around his father's business. It's something that was always around me. I had a connection to this segment. And so those two things came together in terms of, uh, wow, there is really something here. And the last piece that clicked was, uh, okay, there's something big here. I love this industry. There's an ability to really make a difference for small businesses. And then it was like, you know what? this needs to be you doing it it can't be somebody else executing on your vision you need to do it and um you know while i was 35 at the time i did not want to be an entrepreneur until that point in my life at that point you know sort of like the regret minimization framework kicked in it was like if i don't do this i'm going to regret it you know 20 years in the future so um i jumped in so do you categorize yourself as a full-time entrepreneur um, I categorize myself as a full-time founder. Yes, a full-time entrepreneur. I, you know, I, I think uh, when you start a company, the definition of entrepreneur versus CEO, um, they get kind of mixed over the life of a company. Um, right. I, I think I'm becoming more and more of a CEO as time grows, goes, goes by and the company becomes larger. Of course, I'm a founder CEO, so that is something that is always part of my um, sort of outlook. But, um, but you know, as time goes by, as you take more of the role of the CEO and, and your role in the company rather than just being the founder. Sure. Can you share a little bit more about, about the industry and the, and the market of small business, small businesses? What, what's happening today, mm -hmm. especially in the United States that you're observing? What, what is, how do you even get to that, that big pain point that you've observed? Yeah. And, and what, is the sort of the, the, what does the trend look like as we are now in 2021, I guess? 
So I will say that the vision of the company evolved significantly from when we started. We started with a very narrow, um, you know, product set answering factoring and, and making that an online product, then evolved to providing a full range of credit products. And today we really evolved in, in delivering end-to-end -end banking. And so it wasn't, right. there wasn't any pivot along the way. This was a continued expansion of the business model and the strategy. So you're, you're considering it as an involvement, as an involvement yeah. of that narrow idea that you've understood, okay, there's actually a bigger gap than what we thought. Yes, yes. Um, you know, there was an entry point here, but over time realizing that the, the real opportunity is to essentially fix small business banking as, as a whole. And factoring is part of credit and credit is part of banking and banking as a whole is broken for small businesses. And that is the true opportunity that we're looking to solve, which includes everything that belongs under banking, checking accounts, credit, payments, everything else. Um, this has been uh, sort of an evolution that happened through understanding our customers and their pain points. Now, when you uh, are right. referring to small businesses, um, broadly, what has been happening in the last you know, two decades, essentially, they've been outsourcing their financial services from their bank. No longer did they do most of their, or interact with their bank for most of their financial services need. They still hold their checking account with their bank, but payment processing right. they get from Square, from PayPal, from Stripe. Uh, payments they get from bill.com, credit they get you know, historically from third-party lenders like us and others. It's been a world where uh, things that you would expect to get from your bank and corporations definitely get from their bank, small businesses end up needing to rely on many third-party um, providers, not their bank. And that is not an ideal market. That's not an ideal outcome. The ideal outcome is they can actually have a banking partner that can answer all their needs under one place and everything works together seamlessly. And that is what we're doing, providing them access to everything they need under one roof and making it very easy to transact digitally. That's another big point and that really connects to the pandemic. Um, it's interesting, most consumers don't go to the branch anymore. I don't know. When's the last time you went to the branch? I, use, I sometimes ask that question and some people tell you, you no, know, I, I actually went last week. Uh, yeah, I don't even know that there are branches yeah. that are still existing. You're, you're telling me new news now. It's, <laughs> I can't believe that they're, they're still operating in person. They are. And, um, and you know, when you, when you look at the small business segment, interestingly, while consumers over time have stopped going to the branches, definitely the younger generations, small businesses, small business owners on average still go um, um, on average at least once a week to the branch. Why? because they don't have everything at their disposal to be able to transact digitally. You know, adding to that, the pandemic, um, that doesn't work anymore. So certainly there's a lot right. of like tailwinds right now for providers like us to be able to provide a small business the ability to transact digitally, you know, without needing to go to a branch. Certainly right now is, is not a time where small businesses value going to the branch. And, you know, even before it was a hassle and a time suck. Now it's just impossible of course. And, and there's a health con concern. Uh, so that's certainly giving us um, increased increased push for what we're doing. In addition, um, during this time when small businesses have been struggling and, and facing a lot of challenges, uh, given the you know the economic environment, um, you know the banking industry has not necessarily all stepped up to serving them, um, you know, in, in in a very robust way. And so the fact that we are 100% focused on this segment and are able to deliver really, um, you know, great banking experience, I think today even speaks even more volume. No, and I think that one of the most fascinating things that, that I love about what you're doing is that, it, you know, it's not just that you're, that you're coming in and you're educating the market, but you have a series of other players that are coming and they're educating the market yep. from the different angles, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously the digital transactions and the whole, the whole way that we're, that we're dealing with, with digital assets today are, are completely are completely different than 10, 15 years ago. And and having that end-to-end -end banking solutions, I'm looking at the different banks here in Israel and in the United States, the adaptation is so slow. They're still focused on their uh, on, on the different consuming habits. And I think that what you're doing here is, is has impeccable timing. And obviously I can't imagine in, in the in pandemic of 2020, the different, you know, the, the way that you're seeing your vision coming together and how the world has accelerated towards this new world that you're providing a solution to. But Eyal, I also want to pick your brain as the founder and CEO. So you're saying that you're that you're transitioning slowly from, you know, being like the founder and the entrepreneur towards now being the CEO. You're the CEO of a of a multi of a company that raised hundreds of millions of dollars, right? It's a, it's a big responsibility, lots of employees. Uh, now you really are, you know, a, a big a, the CEO of a considerably big company. What are some of the thought shifts that you've had to do as a leader intrinsically? as you're transitioning to your role, because your role today, I am imagining is very, very different from your role four or five years ago, right? And it's been a very quick shift. Yeah. 
I mean, quick is a relative term, right? It's been uh, seven years since we started the company and it feels like, it's like startup years are like dog years, you know? On one hand, it feels, you know, it was just only yesterday we started the company, but when I'm reflecting back and everything that we went through over, over seven years, it's a lot, you know, it feels like a lifetime. Right. Now, yes, the transition is significant from, you know, starting out to over time uh, growing. It doesn't happen in, in one day. In the beginning, right. founder, you do everything that you need to do. You're basically the, you know, the cook, the, you know, the office manager, the, you know, recruiter, the programmer, you do whatever you need to do in the beginning, you roll up the sleeves and, and you work towards getting stuff done. And, um, you know, in, in the beginning, there's a lot of focus on you doing, um, you know, of course, um, you know, you hire employees, but you, you, you are involved in whatever needs to be done. And there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of things to be done and shortage of resources and you make all the decisions in the beginning. A lot of the decisions flow through you. Um, over time, it becomes less of doing, but more of making sure that you have the right people in place and you're empowering them and you're right. creating the right organizational structures to be able to scale. So it's interesting. Um, you know, the, the type of work that you do as a, as a founder um, really changes every two years based on the size of the company and based on the, um, and based on kind of the um, general scale of the business. So, you know, it's right. not one day, but it, it does, I mean, every two years, you kind of need to think about what, what do I need to be doing? What do I not need to be doing? The uh, things that you always own as the, as a CEO is vision. You always are responsible for selling the company. Selling, I mean, to investors, to employees, um, you know, to media. You're always on a sales mode. You always drive culture. That happens from the early days, even when the company is larger. That is a responsibility of, of the CEO. And um, you know, and, and again, vision, right? Like vision and strategy is sort of connected. And there are different types of CEOs. There, there are you know, sort of like more product oriented CEOs and there's more sales oriented CEOs. I personally, um, I would put myself more in the first category. And so I'm very passionate about product and I do get involved in product, but even my level of involvement with product has changed considerably over time. In the beginning, I was literally writing specs myself and working with the engineers over time. Um, you know, as we grew, we had product manager. Now we have a phenomenal chief product officer. Now it's more about just providing feedback around the roadmap, making sure that, you know, um, the vision is instilled with, with the, you know, the plan that we're putting together. And then obviously uh, I have opinions around certain, um, you know, certain product elements, specifically around product experience that I make sure to voice them, but I am no longer in the driver's seat. I'm more of a, of a, of a coach of a, you know, a reactive sort of position. You need to be in a, you know, when you're building a company, the main thing you want to do is make sure that you have really great people that are motivated and are pushing forward because as you scale, you can't be everywhere. So yeah, it becomes from you doing everything to make sure that you have phenomenal people that are able to execute on your vision. So, so it sounds to me like your journey is full of firsts, right? You, you every two years, some, every two years, your role is changing. But that means that really every two years you're reinventing your role as the CEO. You have to adapt to to the new environment. Every time you get a chance to debrief over what you've learned and you mm -hmm. sort of the skills you've mastered, you all of a sudden have to reinvent and master mm -hmm. these new skills. So how do you keep yourself in check? Because mm -hmm. it sounds to me like a lot of the things that you have to deal with every now and then are brand new. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes there are things that, that you don't have the right skill sets to do. Mm -hmm. how, how do you, as the CEO, the person that everybody's looking towards, how do you, how do you keep yourself balanced and, and making sure that you're actually doing the right thing? I think um, the way to do that is learn from everybody around you. Um, learn from your investors and your board. Um, learn from your executive team. Um, it's interesting, as the um, founder or CEO of a company, you get to be the only um, executive on the team without experience and, and learning, right? So you, you actually, right. it's an interesting <laughs> phenomenon. Like you, the company yes. scales, you end up having very senior executives around you which you are much less experienced than them. Okay, and, 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 and that's okay because you bring something different to the table, um, but you need to be um, open and vulnerable and you need to be able to be in a position when you're learning uh, from people around you and you're accepting feedback. And so some of the changes and, and evolution uh, for me, again, this is my first time as a CEO. I wasn't a CEO before. Uh, so it is learning through feedback. It, it, is, it is being, um, in a position where you have your ears open and you're you're hearing what people are saying. And sometimes it's painful feedback. It's people tell you, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing this. Um, and, and, you know, you could be in a position and, and be defensive and, and, 
and clutch on to your previous behaviors, but then you would not grow. So, you know, I think part of my ability to grow as a CEO in this company is just, you know, um, being open uh, to feedback, um, reflecting on it and thinking about how I can get better every day. And that is something that I do. I, I every week, I think to myself, what should I be doing and what shouldn't I be doing? I love that. Eyal, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. I know how busy you are and you have so much on your plate and I really appreciate you taking the time to provide your insights, expertise and uh, and your humble nature, honestly. It really does inspire me to to watch a, a CEO as a learner and, and I hope to take a similar route to yours and, and continue to be a lifelong learner and keep checking out who are the right people around me and what do I need to do to continue learning and adapting. Before we, we leave, I need three words that you would use to describe yourself. Three words, um, honest, hardworking, and funny. Try to take things lightly. I love that. <laughs> Eyal, toda raba. thank you very, very much. And uh, best of luck with the blue vine. And I uh, hope to meet in person after, after this whole thing uh, spans out this pandemic. Thank you. Same here. Take care.